first and foremost, for me, in all these conversations, and my brother knows this is my bread and butter, this type of topic, acknowledging and honoring one's ancestral lineage is front and center, as far as I'm concerned. Understanding where we come from can provide a profound sense of identity and belonging. Reconnecting with ancestral roots can play a strong role in empowering Africans within the diaspora to navigate challenges and embrace their heritage with pride. This can't be emphasized enough, particularly in the times we live in now. If you understand what a person is in this light, it means every action that you are taking, you are suddenly cognizant of the consequences of your action. In that, if the action you are taking is going to put generation many years from now that are unborn in danger, you are going to refrain from that type of action. And if you look across Africa today, or many Africans in the diaspora, the decision that we are taking is not in line with that. Of our culture, and we must carry it with authority and with the power that we have. We must not accommodate any type of marginalization or disrespect. It does not mean that we must be confrontational or egotistic because some of us have that problem. It means that because we know who we are and what we are carrying, and we are carrying it with pride, we are able to sympathize and ignore those who do not understand the message because the message and the culture is not for everyone. Hello and thank you for checking out this video. I'm Obehi Ewanfo, the host of the African Diaspora Storytelling Series. Every two weeks, we meet up on LinkedIn to talk about different ways we can leverage the power of storytelling as people of African descent. Now, this is it. We are united in millions of Africans in the diaspora through the power of our story. It does sound like what you are interested in. Make sure to subscribe to this channel and share this video with your friends who might need it. Now, back to today's conversation. Um, for those of you who are maybe just hearing my name for the first time, uh, my name is Obehi Ewanfo. I live in, in Northern Italy in the city called Verona. So I did the research about the presence of Africans in this part of the world. It has been very uh, important for me to try to understand the story of other people like me. So having spent a couple of years uh, try to document these experiences. Uh, I learned along the line the power of storytelling. I understand that there is a huge power in it that we can use anywhere. We can use the power of story anywhere, absolutely anywhere. And of course, you can see that we pay a lot of attention on how to leverage the power of storytelling in business. That is because in business, we are trying to engage with people. We are trying to connect with people. Uh, and storytelling helps us to do that a lot. In fact, because storytelling helps us to connect with people, that is why it's always valid anywhere there is an involvement in human communication. Because if we are able to communicate with people and speak their language and speak to them in the way that they understand, our selling become much easier. Uh, what we call selling become soft selling. But if we are not able to do that, then the selling become hard selling. And hard selling is very hard. It's just the way it sounds. Uh, where you're going to have uh, a lot of no, a lot of rejection. Of course, we understand that rejection is normal now. But if we can minimize it, it's going to be uh, easier. Another thing I think storytelling does also within those areas is that it helps us to filter out the noise. Uh, you see, 
we are not here for everybody. That is that is the truth. Is the pill that many people in businesses need to swallow. Is that your business is not for everybody. If you tell your story, if you share, if you show your face, people will see you. Those who are interested with you will hang out with you. Those who are not interested, they can go find themselves other people or services that are more appropriate to them. You don't need to take it personal. That is the way it should be. And it's a very good thing that we do it like that. Because if we don't do it, then we will struggle, try to make our product or services fit into people that it didn't really fit into. Whereas if we just say who we are, if people know us by our language, by our communication, then everything becomes clear at the end of the day. Of course, this is not uh, our storytelling series on business. This is about uh, the diaspora storytelling. And of course, today we are talking about uh, how to harness the power of African diaspora heritage for positive change. Because that is another important thing about uh, storytelling, in that it's an instrument for change. If we are able to uh, tailor a good story, we are able to build uh, a mission around that, and we are able to build up people who can follow that mission. And then it becomes the mission of the people now. So if you look at the African diaspora community, whether you are looking at those in the UK, those in the US, or those in other parts of Europe, we need, we extremely need to be able to preserve our history. We need to be able to be the one telling our experiences. Our experiences are important. We don't need to let it fade into the narrative or the mainstream. If we don't champion that story, it's going to fade into that. But if we show our face, if we hone our ski, and if we champion our story, then it is not possible to be lost along the way. And one other good thing about that is that if we are able to master the art of storytelling, and able to tell our story for the way it really is, then we can even leverage it as a business tool. We can even leverage it uh, to be able to build businesses around that. And we can even leverage it to be able to build mission, to be able to help people to leverage it also for their end. I believe that most of us that are in this mission, we are here because we want to make impact. We want to leave something behind. There is a project we have in A classes. It's called Life and Legacy. What that essentially means is that we are taking time to make sure that we re-evaluate our story, the story of those who have been here before us. You see, I started to research about the presence of Africans in Verona when I came here. That is to say, I wasn't really talking about myself. I was talking about other people before me. I understand. I was conscious of the fact, and I'm still conscious of it today, that I am here being able to enjoy the privilege that I have because of other people who have suffered, who have laid down the foundation before me. So that the saying is always true, that we can see far ahead of us because we are standing on the shoulders of giants. But who are these giants? Who are these people who have helped to shape our worldview? So this is why it is important that we champion our story, that we leverage our story for positive change. The story of people who have been here before us. We are not the pioneers. There are other people who have been here before us. Just to share a, just a snippet of the story with you. When I was doing the story of Africans in Verona, there were some people that I interviewed. Most of them now have bought their houses. They are even finished to pay their, their houses. The house is now permanently theirs. But I remember a case of a particular man. He is from Nigeria. When he got here, and he even started to work after a rigorous exercise of moving from invisible to be visible. By that I mean from a state where you are not really visible in the society, you are not in the anagraphy because you don't have documentation, to the point that you now have paper, the state now recognizes you 
as an entity within their territory, it's still difficult for you to have a place to call your home. Nobody was willing to give them any house, even though they have contract of work they were working. So what did these people do? Talking of the pioneers, talking of those who have been here before us, talking of those for whom reason or for uh, whose sacrifices enabled us to have our houses today, enabled us to live in where we are living. They have to literally live on the train station. They will sleep on the train station because they couldn't have a place to stay. And they do this for a several number of years before they could manage to get the first house that they will stay. You see, today, if you are an African in Nigeria or any other African, you happen to find yourself in Verona or in any other part of Italy for that matter or in any other part of maybe you can say in France or in Germany, you are not going to suffer like that. The reason you are not going to suffer is not because you are very smart. It's because other people have suffered for you. That is essentially what we are talking about. That is the heritage, the story and the experiences of other people who have passed through the same road before. But how do we leverage that story to build up a positive change? All right, I'm not going to be doing a monologue here. So I have the privilege of talking to somebody whom I respect a lot, uh, who I've been working also in line with this. Is that, of course, she has a peculiar work uh, that she can also explain to you. Mrs. Gloria, my sister, please, the mic is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Behi. I like that word, peculiar. Hmm, okay. <laughs> my name is Gloria Tinu Ogumbadejo. Um, greetings, everybody. Well, let me greet you in my own traditional way, Alafia, which really means I'm asking about your well-being uh, emotionally, in, psychologically. So I'm wishing you well and also invoking your well-being by saying Alafia. So Alafia, everybody. But, um, yes, my name, like I said, is Gloria. I'm an ordained minister, psychotherapist, mental health advocate, a writer, and then ancestral lineage healing practitioner. I support African women ministers looking to add spirituality to their ministry. I support Africans generally in the diaspora who are looking for cultural reconnection, emotional, psychological, intergenerational healing, strengthening their identity, tapping into their intuition, bringing harmony and balance into their lives, reclaiming cultural traditions, looking back to our elders and ancestors to gain wisdom, direction, instruction, protection. In other words, looking back to move forward, claiming our divine gifts, strengths, and blessings. First and foremost, for me, in all these conversations, and my brother knows this is my bread and butter, this type of topic, acknowledging and honoring one's ancestral lineage is front and center, as far as I'm concerned. Understanding where we come from can provide a profound sense of identity and belonging. Reconnecting with ancestral roots can play a strong role in empowering Africans within the diaspora to navigate challenges and embrace their heritage with pride. This can't be emphasized enough, particularly in the times we live in now. There's so much strength and wisdom and guidance that resides in our ancestral lineage. We need to understand, seek, practice our oral traditions, engage in family stories and cultural practices as a way of life in order to preserve and transmit ancestral knowledge across generations. Let it become a way of life. You know, we have to be intentional about it. Sharing personal anecdotes or testimonies from people who have experienced profound insights and transformative experiences through connecting with their ancestral roots. You may even have experienced it yourself. You just are not aware of it, that that's what's been happening. Let's dig deep. Let's engage in conversations that are meaningful. Let's change some of the unhelpful, irrelevant chatter that floods many of our spaces. I have been mandated with that work 
And it has been truly a blessing to see the impact it has had in people's lives. Just even after one session, I, I've worked with people and they've said they've had the best sleep, most peaceful, restful sleep that they have had in a long time. Their ancestors have started working within them. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's none of the uh, untruths and lies that uh, we've been conditioned to think about what our traditions are. It's up to us. Nobody can tell our stories for us. Nobody can tell us who we are. Acknowledging the historical legacies, slavery, colonization, and systematic oppression can lead, how it can lead to unresolved trauma, which can manifest in individual and collective experiences of pain, grief, and disconnection. The retriggering of these experiences that are felt by black and brown people every day all require deep ancestral generational healing individually and within the context of the African diaspora. Seems like we can't get a break. What, every day there's another story that on some, on some level, there's a connection because if the person looks like me, looks like that we know that somehow there is that interconnectedness. We need to continue to create more safe spaces like this one for storytelling, validation, collective healing. It's also important where appropriate to invite others to listen and learn and you know, share you know, other groups to, to come and hear and share and tell their own experiences. We're all human first and foremost. Let us where we can, and if it is within our capacity or remit to showcase, promote, individuals, organizations that are doing this work, that prioritize healing and resilience, resilience building. Our cultural relevance and practices are, are things that we, we need to sort of ask people in our families, do our research, find out, find out who you are, where you come from. I'm Nigerian from the Yoruba traditions with a deep respect for African Yoruba spirituality, the practices of my ancestors that guide me. African Yoruba spirituality holds a holistic worldview rooted in interconnectedness of all beings and the re reverence for divine forces manifested in nature and human existence. Talking about our Ori, which is our personal destiny, our share, which is life force energy. I'm usually hugely insulted to my core that someone who doesn't look like me, who doesn't know who I am, doesn't know where I'm from, can come to my land and tell me that these traditions are worthless and should be despised, which to me is a way of encouraging me to despise myself, my ancestors, and hate who I am, pass that on to my children, how dare you? But then again, how dare we accept that? I'm just going to take a pause here. <laughs> take a deep breath. Mm. 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 Sometimes we have to take, take a minute to understand how we got to where we are now and the crisis many of us and our children are in. These are the things we have some control of. Changing the narratives, taking back what is rightfully ours. Everybody's doing that, doing what, you know, taking back what they think is theirs, fighting for their culture, fighting for their religion, fighting for their everything. What are we doing? We have things that we also need to reach that will, uh, that will enhance our, our daily lives, that that will protect our children, the next generation, because they're all at risk. And many of you know what I'm talking about. One of my really dear white friends asked me the other day, why a lot of black women call themselves sis and queen, and they call black men brother and king. She said she found it quite fascinating and wondered if it was some kind of code of, that has a deeper meaning. At first I thought, how do I take this? 
And then I thought, no, that, you know, she's, she's just said what's on her mind. That's fine. And she said she couldn't imagine calling any of her white friends sis or queen. She said she can barely call her own sister sis. And, and that was it right there. She was right in a way that it is an unwritten, well understood code because we are lifting, exalting one another up. We've been called so many abusive, nasty things. So we speak with love and respect to one another. And when I hear a brother or sister call me queen, I feel like one. I was at a conference the other day and uh, the young, beautiful black man introduced me and said, our queen called my name, will now speak. I couldn't speak for, for a few seconds because I was overwhelmed. You know, I, I felt by his calling me that, I could hear my father, I could hear my brothers, I could hear my male cousins, I could hear my uncles, because that's how they thought of me. I don't know this, this brother from anywhere, but by his set, calling me that way, I, I, I was lifted. You know, words matter. So let's, let's think about what we're doing. Let's think about how we talk to one another. And I'll yield the mic now. Thank you so much for that, uh, Sister Gloria. That is really beautiful. That is beautiful. I, I remember that point where you say you wanted to uh, pause for some moment to, to reflect, to digest the information that is coming to you. Uh, you see, a couple of days ago, I was interviewing um, an expert on African spirituality. Uh, we were talking about knowledge. Actually, we were talking about the African presence in the ancient world, looking at African presence in Europe, in America, in Asia, before the present time, of course. Then before we get to that point, he talked to me about knowledge. And he said something to the effect that knowledge is a revelation, is something that comes to us. But if that is the case, where is it coming from? And he it says, it's coming from our ancestors, from our holy ancestors, those who have lived before, so that you need to look at it as an inspiration, a kind of a download that is getting into you. So you can look at it in another way that you are opening up yourself to receive. Therefore, knowledge is not like you have knowledge. Knowledge is you receive knowledge. And that again now will be very important within the entire conversation of connection, of connecting, that we are tapping into our oneness, our source, our resource, which is not a product of a university hypothesis. It's not a product of Harvard or, uh, or an Oxford University uh, lecturer who decide that this is what life is. What life is, is we, in that I sort of tend to say this quite often, that by talking about our ancestors, our history, our origin, we are not talking about hypotheses. We are talking about the real thing. In that one day, a man and a woman came together. You are a product of that. Before then, another man and another woman came together. You are a product of that. Before that, and before that, and before that, in a series of endless generations, that is who we are. So when we talk of honoring our ancestors, we are talking of honoring that lineage, that line that have never been broken. And that is different now if you just want to call yourself because you have learned something in school, you know. But what if what you learn in school have taught you to disconnect from that resource? Because now, if you disconnect that, you are sitting on the sand and you can actually disappear because you, do, you are not rooted. So all these are important for us. Leveraging 
the power of our heritage. That is our story. We know where we are coming from. We are really on the ground, a solid ground, a solid foundation since the beginning of time. All right, I'd like to pass the mic to Dr. Marcia. Dr. Marcia, please share with us in line with the conversation of today. Good morning, everyone. I, as you can see, I'm having some internet issues. And I, I feel that Gloria has covered so much and gotten me so much attached emotionally to this topic that I think it's very reassuring that we, we understand the heritage, the treasure that we carry as African descent. And wherever you are in the world, it does not matter. The blood runs in your brain. You are authentically and officially who you are coming from. And I want us to understand that regardless of how we think, the choices, the decisions, the habits, the mindsets of our ancestors linger with us in our very spirit and in our vein and in our blood because it either hinders us or it propels us. I want to go back to something that Gloria said, and it is very important, Gloria, because sometimes our ancestors, whether consciously or unconsciously, speak things in the universe when they were angry or they were upset or they were happy and pronounce either a blessing or curse over the generations to come as they put it out in the universe because sometimes they make some strong oaths because they are so upset or they have been so hurt or they have been so betrayed or they, have, they are so disappointed that they make some oaths. And a lot of us do it today, even as modern persons. We have some experiences in our lives that make us pronounce, make some absolute pronouncements that mar us and our generation to come because of how we put it out in the universe. So I just want to, to tag that in. In, in, in my opinion, the, 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 the conscious conversation such as this one, and I want to celebrate you, Obihi, for always doing this and for putting it in the faces of persons who sometimes want get it or feel better or comfortable having it as a, as a carriage is not a visible bag. It's an invisible bag. And that is not good enough. I, I believe with all my heart that as individuals, sometimes because we are dispersed across the globe, we question if our ancestral roots, our heritage makes sense in an effort to fit in with we hide and we become ashamed or we become uncomfortable if to say who we are and why we are. And sometimes it is to persons who really don't care, really. They see the value that you bring and they see how you constantly show up and how efficient you are. And they honor you because of what you are showing to them and what you are. And they, in their minds, hope that you are genuine. Sometimes we try to impress and please persons by accommodating beliefs and their values. And they themselves are wondering why, because we are such a total package. And I, and, and, and I find that when persons are in those global settings, they try to do that. And so I want to focus on what we are not to do if we want to harness the power of our heritage for positive change. We are not to tokenize or essentialize what we have because of the stereotypes or simplistic views or biases or prejudices or narratives that are in our situation and our circle. We, that's, we, we took our rightful place, even though we were not in our own country and culture. We took our rightful place. Whatever is the sum total of who we are, placed us and prepared for where we are now functioning and we must recognize our diversity and the complex nature of our experiences within the diaspora and we must carry a refrain of greatness and authority and not a refrain that makes us tokenize our culture for the sake of 
superficial representation. And a lot of us are not sure who we are or if it is the right thing to do or why we should be who we genuinely are. And if it will take us anywhere, it took us there. It took us right there. What we must do is not romanticize where we are or take it as a fetish because the African heritage is one of the richest in the world, if not the richest. Because the next to it is Caribbean people and Caribbean people are really Africans. So let's get right there. So if two of us are a powerful force to carry our heritage, then it must not of our culture and we must carry it with authority and with the power that we have. We must not accommodate any type of marginalization or disrespect. It does not mean that we must be confrontational or egotistic because some of us have that problem. It means that because we know who we are and what we are carrying and we are carrying it with pride, we are able to sympathize and ignore those who do not understand the message because the message and the culture is not for everyone. And sometimes we push it onto people. There are some of us who use it for personal gain or entertainment purposes. So we showcase our culture, but the motive is incorrect. We have the wrong motive and we have to be very careful about that. We must never ignore the historical context of our heritage and the sociopolitical nature of it. And because of the years of abuse and lose, I, I, I'm saying we must acknowledge those of us who experienced it and those who hear stories and are living in the post-mortem of colonial oppression and slavery and the systematic oppression that they have sh that have shaped our experiences of a people, we must understand that we are conquerors. And we must carry that warrior spirit in a very divine and precious way that does not make us combative, but make us informants of what is the truth. And we must, we must carry that button and we must engage in cultural appropriation, which is the proper acknowledgement and understanding and respect and significance for who we are and why we are and how far we have come, and the fact that we will never leave this planet before God is ready. There is a song that Bob Marley sings, and it says, them are got tired for see me face. They can't get me out of the race. No matter how we smother, and no matter how we deny as a people, and no matter how ashamed we are of our culture, our culture lives on because the culture of Africa does not really need us. We must be honored that we are light bearers because people tell it. People who are not of us, many of them appreciate us and the culture that we bring. And they tell it. Is the fact is, how they tell it is sometimes very disturbing because they have no right to tell it. But then again, as you say, Gloria, they, we gave them that right because we are too silent. We are silent observers, and some of us have become silent critics. We are good at saying what they have not represented well, and we are good at saying what they have not said and what is incorrect, but we are not good representers. We do not carry the message ourselves, and so we are really not to complain when other people see the need to carry the message. We, we sometimes act as outsiders of our own heritage and culture, and we avoid speaking and yet we resist the opposing outsiders perspective we must pray and the efforts to understand and promote our heritage among those persons who are authentic and true to what we carry we are not to neglect our voices and we must not appropriate the stereotypes or misinformation that is out there by our silence by our shame and by our own disregard or misunderstanding of who we are and we must never prioritize profit over ethics because some of us promote the culture, as I said, for profit. And that in itself is an exploitive method that we ourselves become looters of our own heritage and the cultural resources that are out there because that in itself is an unethical practice. 
that only prioritize your financial gain at the, in the expense of our cultural integrity or community well-being. I want to stop there. I have so much more to say, but I want to stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and of course, you, you remain. Go you, ahead. You, you are around. So I will pass on some questions to you later for more reflection. Uh, well, uh, to those in the audience, uh, if you have anything to say regarding the conversation that we are sharing here, because you can actually see it from the passion uh, of what people are talking about, because it concerns us. This is about us. Uh, this uh, LinkedIn audio room is created also for this reason, for us to express ourselves, for us to say what we are feeling, for us to uh, be the protagonist of our story, so that we don't need to delegate this, uh, this task to somebody. This is too delicate a task to be delegated to somebody else. We need to put our face in it. We need to share it. We need to talk about our experiences. When we don't feel good about something, we don't need to pretend that, ah, okay, they will understand. No, they will not understand. It is up to us to say, no, it's hurting me. Please stop doing that because I don't like it. You see, Dr. Martial is saying, we don't need to just be overly accommodating. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be accommodating. There is a difference between renouncing who you are to accommodate other people, to make them feel good, than troubling the water a little bit because you are here, you are present. This is your time. This is the only time you have to be able to represent your people, your culture, your identity, who you represent in the universe. Now, i like to say something that I've learned from some of my guests. You see, one of the advantages of talking to a lot of people, or let me put it correctly, one of the advantages of listening or having the opportunity to listen to a lot of people is that you have the chance of learning. So this... Uh, uh, assistant professor in U.S. of African origin, of course, from Zimbabwe, uh, taught me something important about personhood, which is what does it even mean to be a person? Of course, I know this is, of course, taken from the African philosophy of life because there is a way we see life. Even though you might not have it in a book to read, but it's so interiorized in you that you don't really need to read it in a book because you leave it. It is when you don't leave it that you are trying to find the meaning somewhere that somebody needs to explain to you. You see, nobody needs to tell you who your mother is. You know. Except, of course, you are suffering from a terrible situation, then you would be asking, who is my mother? So in this person who, um, he was saying, Africans see a human being not just as an individual, as an individual entity that is existing on and by itself. Instead, a human being is seen as a person who is connected to what has happened before. Therefore, the ancestors, the experiences of the people that have come before him or her. The present, where you are currently, because for you to even make a connection, you need to be, which is the present. Where is the context where you find yourself today? Maybe you are in France, you are in Jamaica, you are in London, you are in the U.S. Where do you find yourself today? Now, and the future. The future includes the unborn, those who will be here 500 years from now, those who will be born in your lineage, those who will be born, they will mention your name, they will be asking, but who was that person? Because many things would have happened before those people will come. All those people are part of who you are as an identity. Now, if we take some time to elaborate on that simple rudimental definition of what a person is, we see now that it is the foundation of how we build our society. If you understand what a person is in this light, it means every action that you are taking, you are suddenly cognizant of the consequences of your action. In that, if the action you are taking is going to put 
generation many years from now that are unborn in danger, you are going to refrain from that type of action. And if you look across Africa today, or many African city diaspora, the decision that we are taking is not in line with that. Should I give you an example? Let's take one key example. The assassination of Thomas Sankara, the then president of Upper Volta. Now, what was Thomas Sankara keyed for? He was key to appeal the God of the Euro-Western society because Thomas Sankara stood for those simple idea that Burkina Faso, of course, as Upper Volta, should be able to live by the food that they have on their land and they should produce what they want to eat. And that is in contrast to how African uh, geopolitical economy is defined. They want us to eat what is sent to us and they want to take what they want from our land. That is not economy, that is called exploitation. So now we have this young man saying that, no, that is not right. Let's build up economy for the interest of the local people. And that is what he was killed for by another person from uh, the same country. Now, if you take a look at the simple explanation of what a person is, you see now that that is not in line with that. Because many people are going to suffer the consequences of that. I mean, you don't know who you are. Because if you know who you are, you will be careful of the action that you are taking. Because they have consequences to generation many years after you have died. And they also have consequences of many years even before you were born. It's simple, yes, but it's not very easy for many people to understand. And that again is a heritage, our history, our experiences. And we cannot delegate this to somebody else, to somebody to tell this story, to say, oh, but CNN didn't include us in their narrative. But who said CNN is going to include us in their narrative? Ah, that book about humanity, they didn't include us. They will only include us if it's in their interest. But if that is all we have to be able to represent ourselves in the world, that is going to be, we are going to be shortchanging ourselves. So we need to be the one, the advocate, the one who are telling our story, the one who are saying, this is me, this is who I am, this is where I'm coming from, these are my ancestors, I am carrying their torch. These are the people that I represent. You see, in one film, I think that is the Amazing Grace of Amistad, one of the slaves uh, says something to the effect that all my ancestors are going to intervene because I am the only reason they have ever existed. I want you to take some time to reflect on that. That individual or whoever crafted that piece is talking about the understanding that that person or that character know that life is just beyond the immediate present. You are representing several thousands of people, several generations, many years before you, and also many years after you would have passed on. We need to take time to reflect on this because it suddenly changed how we show up in the world, how we talk to people, how we accept contract, how we frame our presentation, how we want other people to talk to us. Because it's not just about the ego us. It's about all of us put together. All right, now, I want to pass a question to my sister again, Sister Gloria. Uh, I don't know what you would like to say to the effect of the role of the diaspora in shaping our narrative for change. Because we want a change, but that change is going to come from us. We're going to be the one to shape it, that this is what we want. What is our role in that? 
I just want to first of all say thank you, Sister Marcia. Um, anytime you speak, you know, I, I want to stand up, you know. <laughs> um, I, I just feel so moved with your passion, your knowledge, your wisdom, your intellect. So uh, let, 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 me, let, me, let me honor you first by, by saying that. And, and also, you know, forgive me if I'm, I'm wrong. I believe you spoke uh, a, a, bit, a little bit of Patois, I think, you know, um, please correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. But it's, it's interesting. It, this thing about, Brother Bay, I will come back to the question, but you know, I always go off script. I have to, I have to say what's on my mind. What what was present for me? This thing about interconnectedness. I don't. I wouldn't say I don't understand. You know, uh, word for word, uh, uh, patois. But when Sister Masia spoke, I understood everything she said. That's part of this interconnectedness. I, I understood from my core. You know um, what she was saying and the meaning of what she was saying. This is where you're connected to people, when you're connected to your people. You know, you may speak different languages. Um, I, I'm a therapist. I have um, uh, worked with people, who's, uh, African women who speak different languages, but we could understand one another. We could be in a space together. We could feel what it is that send, send uh, emotions, send... Uh, um, what you call it, uh, spiritual feelings to one another in a positive way. If you understand, you understand what I'm saying. But again, it's this thing about being connected and how we need to, to, to guard all our traditions jealously. If you don't know about your traditions, find out about it. Ask, you know, the, the, the joy and beauty with all the negative things we say about social media and the internet, you can find out anything. You know, we need to take the time, step away from that that noise, that that all the rubbish that's out there. It, it, it part of the work of all of that stuff is to is to confuse us, is to keep our mind in chaos. You know, and we see we every day we see it, we hear it. So I just wanted to to start with that. Well, again, I want to say something else about um, the th like the things that are on my mind. Um, about names, um, the, the, the importance of it, you know, calling, understanding the meaning of your name, hearing your name when it's called, feeling it, understanding uh, what your parents were thinking when they gave you that name, responding to the meaning of the names. All of these things are all part of our traditions, our cult, all the things that reawaken us in, and take us to the place where we need to be. Harnessing cultural heritage and, and uh, how can we leverage this? Yes, we can definitely leverage our African diaspora heritage as a source of inspiration, resilience, and activism for positive social change by working collaborati collaboratively. <laughs> quite a mouthful. And working with others, expanding these kind of spaces that we have here, raising awareness, encouraging others to explore the importance of reclaiming their identities that might have been lost to them and they are unaware of it. When you resonate with someone, no one has to convince you. Like they say, when if you know, you know. And sometimes, you know, you can hear something. My grandmother always say, when you, when you hear the truth, you know it. You, there's no denying. We've been in the de denial for too long. We've been, um, there's a lot going out there to keep us in denial. We need to recognize this interconnectedness of struggles for liberation for our minds. We may no longer be in physical shackles, but sadly, many of us are binded mentally and are clueless. And all those things Sister Marcia said that were just perfect. We really need to find ways to see where we are causing harm to ourselves. You know, Africans have been blessed with something very special. That, that thing that uh, Art, uh, Archbishop Tutu called Ubuntu, our humanity, uh, interconnect, I keep repeating the word interconnectedness because it's, it's, it's real. Our ability to forgive naturally, 
our love for community. I mean, when I see my uh, Yoruba brothers and sisters, they, those who I'm older than, they'll call me Egbon. Egbon means big sister. You know, the way we talk to one another, I've spoken about that before. Or I will see somebody that uh, I'm older than, and I'll say a bro, which means younger sister. So it's not just words. We're, we're, we're saying very specific. The way we talk is uh, our, our words are very intentional. I know from the Yoruba tradition, our, our language, we're very intentional with our words. And these things are not there for nothing. And we just, some of us have been have been taught to, 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 to frown upon all these things, which like I said before, is causing us a lot of harm. Being mindful is real. To stop and check yourself. What conversations do we participate in? Are we honoring our ancestors or are we letting them down? They laid the groundwork. They are watching. Our children are watching and listening. I mean, shocked many times when I see and hear some of our conversations out there. Sometimes we hold the stick to help others beat us with. It, 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 it's, it's, quite, it's quite saddening at times. And I know since I've been, I've stepped into this work, I walk with pride. I walk like my, my, uh, my Angelus said, I walk like I have diamonds between my thighs. It's not out of arrogance. It's in the knowledge that I come from kings and queens, from warriors, and I'm here to carry their glory and that of the divine, to show up as they would want me to. Let me take another breath. We are in a crisis, brothers and sisters. Our children need, need us to step up. We can make all the money in the world, but spiritually, ancestrally, we cannot allow ourselves to be lost in the darkness that's out there. The darkness that's working over time to cover the light. No, brothers and sisters, no, we can't let it happen. Just gonna take a break here. Thank you so much for that. Uh, that message is going home. Uh, it's a call to action, uh, actually, that we need to know that we know now. Um, if you know something, you cannot unknow it again. Like, if you know something is right, the only uh, thing that you can do from that moment on is to pretend. But you know that you know. So this moment, with the tools that are available today, we are able to learn about our culture. Sister Gloria was saying, even if you don't know, but you can ask. You can ask. I know that there can be uh, some delicate and complicated um, situation because then we'll be talking about our mindset, the way we see things, uh, which uh, sort of make it that uh, we don't care about things that are of value to us. Instead, we like to wipe away our time by uh, things that make us just jump and be happy. Yes, but sometimes we need to grow to the level of taking responsibility for that thing that we are doing. Because we are no babies. We need to take action. Take responsibility for what we are doing. All right, I have uh, Josia in the room. Uh, please share with us before I pass the mic to Dr. Matia. Well, uh, I wanted to add something to this this question this morning. Um, I'm going to start from the grassroots. And what I mean by that is I'm going to speak as someone that's of the culture. Of course, I am of the culture. I grew up in Nigeria, then moved out and moved to the United States, where I've been for over 25 years. Now, what I want to talk about is in the wake of understanding and knowing a lot of things about what happened in the past and why we are in the position and why we must try hard to work together to be out of the position. So I like to use the word here in the U.S. to refer to communities that uh, I serve. 
as low resource communities or underserved communities. And what did I notice that is common in all these communities uh, is that they work really hard. They're not lazy. They work really hard, but the capital resources are not retained in those communities. What am I saying? I'm saying that they work hard, but they spend the money outside their communities. And there are many reasons around that. And when you do that, the, the dollar or the money or whatever currency you use will not be consistently shared in your community because it leaves your community. It doesn't um, maintain the circulation that uh, guarantees that your community uses up those resources. Now, I've made a, uh, you can consider it a claim or uh, a statement, but it's not a flagrant statement, whether you're in Toronto, Canada, Southeast London, or whether you're in uh, Lagos, Nigeria, the problem is defined, as defined is the same. We work so hard, but our capital resources are not maintained or retained in our communities. And therefore, we lack. We look for access to funding, and those who provide the funds provide it with conditions because the intent never changes. The intent is always going to be the same. And now, going back to the topic of the room, harnessing the power of African diaspora heritage for positivity or uh, to influence positive um, goals amongst the people of uh, uh, African descent, descent. Sorry. So, how can we achieve this? First, uh, uh, my uh, sister uh, Gloria Tinubu. Igbomi, I would like to say, she made mention of a whole bunch of stuff that were very interested. And I'm going to tell her line. I will tell her line because a lot of people here are not aware of some sacred and scientific knowledge that if we know, then we'll recognize that we have to move further down and work hard to reclaim uh, a fitting position that's ours, okay? So how do we do this? It's going to be tough, but bear with me for a moment. A lot of us came to the diaspora for ranging from economic reasons to meet up with our families and to be with, uh, to go to school and everything like that. There's just diverse uh, background as far as our intent for being here, uh, being in any other foreign country. So you can now say that by default of the country that we live in, we are multilingual. Now, when we go to these places, we learn the way, not that we're learning something that we've done already now, but we just have to learn it according to the system that we live in. So once we do that, uh, that knowledge stays with us. Nobody can take it away. We work in those countries and we make money and all of that. But we have to remember that we came from a place. So that's what I mean by towing her line. We came from a place and the knowledge, what makes us who we are, is rooted to where we came from. And what, what do I mean by that? The culture. You see, your name, your name is a part of your language. Your language is your culture. Your culture is your root. Your root is where your power is. So whatever we learn, if we do not share it with those that, that we left behind, we're wasting our time. And those that we left behind must recognize for them to get to another level, they need us. Because, for instance, I live in the U.S. I'm one of those people that uh, when I think I have a broad way of thinking, I don't look at something from a myopic perspective. When I came to the U.S., I made it a part of, a part of, a part of duty to study the African Americans, to understand who they are. So when I was doing the study, I realized that it was the African Americans that told the African leaders who came to America in the 60s to go to school that they can get independence now, because the 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 American um, the Europeans have finished a war. They're trying to rebuild. They need at least 20 years to rebuild. And they were telling African leaders, this is the time for you guys to get independent because of the deal 
America made with Europe that made it impossible for Europe to become anything at all. That's how independence came in America and came to the Africans, we Africans. It's not because we fought so hard for it. It's because of the situation of the people that are in the position to oppress or uh, unoppress. So again, <laughs> trickling down now, I, I, I spent a lot of time to recognize that the African-Americans had the ability to do a whole bunch of stuff that we can imagine sometimes. Imagine living with an enemy, someone that you know would kill you and you survive. Think about that for a minute. Someone took you, enslaved you, and you were able to develop the skills to survive them. And today, we see a bunch of the people we call African-Americans, but altogether, we are all called Blacks and classified as Blacks in the United States of America. So we have to rethink our position when we make reference to this group of people, because without them, we can't have what we have today. That is how diaspora helps the continent. For us that are sending money, that's a way of helping. But at this time, with the rise in technology, <laughs> Sending money is no longer enough. It's no longer viable. So what we must do, must do is to take the knowledge of what we've learned. If you're an engineer, you package it up and send it back. It's called knowledge exchange. All developing countries, all developed nations, they did it. They organized amongst themselves, pass knowledge around, and allow the people that are back home to grow. A case in point is India. Everyone here knows that. Now, with that being said, let's go back to our route now. In our route, there's something called Afa and Ifa. These two things, you must not take them for granted. Every civilization has a way of making prediction. Every civilization has a way of understanding things. Someone here asks a question, where does the knowledge come from? The knowledge is already in the spectrum. Everything you can say, will say, have said, or think of saying is already there. It's in the spectrum. You tap into it. Because your consciousness, in, in, in the language that I speak, uh, your consciousness is always going to be your consciousness. How it rises or falls is going to depend on you. The body is a housing. It's just a housing that houses the active force and then houses the operating system you run on. In the language that I speak, the operating system that you run on makes you unique. It's called Agu. These are deep sciences that are taught in universities today, but our ancestors knew it millions of years ago. They call it quantum mechanics, but the ancestors knew that everyone came from... You have one person, a spiritual person, watching over you from a distance who influences how your life comes out. As a software engineer, I write code. I know what my code will do. If it doesn't do it, I correct it. But I'm not always watching my code to see if they do the job because my code is me. I am my code. Are you guys getting this? My code is me. I am my code. I can't be watching over it. I've already set it out to go do its job and its duty. So having this knowledge will help you to take control of your life and your future regardless of what anybody says to you. So you need to connect back to understand that the Ifa or Afa, as it said, where I come from, there's only maybe two group, three groups of people that practice this in the world. You can find it in southwest of Nigeria, southeast and middle belt. That's it. And this is the center of the modern technology. This is the heart of the modern science and technology. What this means is, <clears throat> if you understand this system, and where I came from, I find it difficult to believe that someone from, from Africa would think that they are different from another group in Africa. These are the challenges that I have. Even someone in Zimbabwe or Uganda thinks that they are different from someone in, in south, southeast or southwest of Nigeria. These are the weapons of the oppressors. Now, let me give you an example before I digress even uh, I, I go back to the track. 
in in Zimbabwe or Uganda or all over that place, let's say I think Zimbabwe, they have a name called Chukwabuzo. Chukwabuzo. If you go to Igbo land, you have the same name. Chukubuzo. But they think they are different. That's even far, right? Let's go to Nigeria itself. Let's go to Yoruba and Igbo. Okay? So you have a goat, a male goat. Then the Yoruba says Ewure. But they think they are not the same people. You have stone. Igbo say Okute. Yoruba say Okuta. They, they still think they are not the same people. If you want me to continue going, I'll keep going. They have similar words, behave alike, but because of the seed planted by the oppressor, they think they are different. And that affects the growth. Even in the diaspora, they don't work together and they don't come together to have a finished solution that will save their people. I've already mentioned there are three places you can find Ifa, Afa. What if those two, three people work together? It will be easier to conquer computer science, artificial intelligence, and a whole bunch of engineering uh, sectors. But they're not working together. But they have this knowledge that nobody else has in the world. Now, the artificial intelligence is being used and is centered in English, English speaking language or Latinized languages. <laughs> but is that all? Everyone in the world speaks like I know a majority of the world population speak English because it's used in all of that. But when it comes to creativity, you will be more creative in your genetically natural operating language, especially when you're using them to create. There are billions of people in Southeast Asia, Africa, India who do not speak English. Can you now see where I'm coming from? If a group of people can work together, you can carve a niche in the world today where you can prosper. They say that the riches are, the, are in the niches. So the word here is, is a word to the wise. Stop the division. You're all one, the same people, all the way from Nigeria down to South Africa. These are all the same people from Bantu movement. I don't care if it's nilotic or whatever. That's a mixture somewhere we need to find it. That's what I do for a living. I study anthropologically and use science to determine people and how they can work together in technology. That's what I do. So I was able to figure out that the, all these people are the same. And if they are the same, they share something peculiar amongst themselves. I start looking at the names. They have all the chi 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 in them, chuku 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 in them. Chi is your your spirit self, which is found in 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 Yoruba uh, uh, um, cosmology as well. It's your spirit self that exists, of which if you connect to it, you become the person, the Christ person, the righteous Christ person of quality and indefatigable strength who supersedes, who goes through our difficulties and rise to become the best and possible best that can be. That's what that is. And with that, I'll stop right here. I don't want to go too, too deep into all these things, but thank you guys for giving me the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jesse. I appreciate you, brother. I do. Uh, of course, I just sent you a message uh, um, asking you if you would like to speak more on this issue on our podcast, because there... Uh, we do go deep uh, because this is the knowledge. Like uh, you heard me say, and of course you also confirm it, that the knowledge is not only an intellectual uh, intellectual concept. There are actually things that are already here because our ancestors have lived. They have lived for thousands of years. They have experimented on different things from mathematics, astronomy, physics, science, all this knowledge that we are having today, they're actually um, a, a changing of the dynamics. They, you put the things together, you give it a steady uh, command, it gives you a different result, but they are basically the same thing. 
Uh, Josiah is an expert in um in in coding. If he show you his script, you will see that they are written in letters. And you see mm, one, you see two, you see plus, you see minus, you see zero, you see point, you see comma, you see at. All these words, when they are aligned accordingly, they will break into anything. With me now that I started to sort of get uh, a little a a tickle when I uh, put just W, 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 then I put a dot on it, then I put anything on it. I am not on Internet uh, space yet. I am writing on Microsoft Word. Then you see that test is highlighted. If you hold your shift and click on it, it will automatically prompt to an Internet page and it's looking for that. Who is giving you that command? What is happening there? You see, all the knowledge really, I think, are available. All we just need to do is to tap into it and to use the knowledge again for our, for our good, for the better good of all of us. I was uh, talking to this expert again. He's the same person because we have really, for this very knowledgeable Africans, uh, about African spirituality, sometimes we do up to like, I don't know, a six episode I've done with this man. And this episode has sometimes like three hours, sometimes one hour, 30 minutes. A minimum of one hour, 30 minutes, one hour is what we do. Because these things need time to explain. They are not on the superficial level. Dr. Masia talk about not be on the superficial. I kick against that. In Obehi podcast, I just let my guests know, here we go deep. So just take the time. We are not in haste. I'm not here to do just uh, uh, explain a human consciousness in two minutes. I don't do that. I know you cannot do that. So this is important. So I'm urging all of us that know something to please share. If you know something, share with others. Now, there is an idea that I don't like. Is the idea of the strong man. And this idea is sometimes or is always in favor of the Euro-Western agenda in Africa, which is making a person very good and very powerful so that it can dominate the entire population. This is not good for us because that individual can be controlled. Like in the case of Pobia, for example, of Cameroon, he had been in the presidency or the president of the country for over 40 years. It's easier for France to take care of one man, but they are not willing to take care of the entire population. You see, Dabisa Moyo wrote a book not too long ago, and it was she was making reference to Western capitalism and Eastern capitalism, in this case referring to uh, China. And she was saying something to the effect that because the West and the American in this case are very rich, they don't need to care about the people in terms of distribution of resources. So a lot of very few people can be very rich, therefore capital intensive. Now, China want to play the same game, but China do not have what America have, which is a lot of money. But they have a lot of resources in terms of human resources. So they flip the game. They went on labor intensive. Now, at the end of the day, what happened? A lot of people in China became rich. That is, they have small money, but a lot of people have small money. If you multiply this number of people that have small money, their income just grew up a little bit. Against maybe US, you see that they have become very powerful now. Now, why am I saying this? I am saying this to me that the knowledge that we have, first of all, it is clear that is not only our own tool, it is our knowledge. Let's share. Please, let's share with the population. If we share with the population, then we will save ourselves. It is no one man can save Africa. No one man can build a bridge, but the people can build a bridge. If we help our people with the right knowledge, we will weather any storm, wherever it's coming from. I see Josiah um, uh, show his mic. Please go ahead and say something. 
so what I wanted to say is, uh, I don't want to go too deep into things. I respect what you do. What I wanted to say is, <clears throat> you see, in uh, the world that we live in today, there are three uh, opposing uh, powers that, that do exist. You have, they're not quite opposing. You have technology power, military power, economic power. Everybody knows where the military power lies and who has that. Economic power, we know who has that. Of recent, in the past two years, it's been where it is, like China. Technology power, we're not very sure because many nations have ability to come up with something new. Yes, technology makes a country great. If you ask me, I will say China has technology power as well because the, the number of new things that is coming out of China is crazy. But I do know one thing. I do know that if you understand AFA and EFA, are you an engineer or a scientist? There is nobody that can compete with you because everything you're going to bring to this world is going to be really out of this world. Now, the problem we have as Africans is we think that what makes us who we are has to come from France, has to come from Germany, has to come from the U.S. That's not true. If you've lived abroad, you recognize who's doing all those jobs for them. You have Africans, you have Indians, you have Chinese. These are the people that are doing the job. So what does that tell you? What you need is with you. It's not out there. Check the number of uh, 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 patents in the U.S. 85% foreign born. 85% are foreign born. So the IP makes a country because IP is is something that proves that you've been able to perfect a particular part of science and apply it in technology and it does work. So you probably have a very high level of uh, integration and uh, production uh, level, uh, like how your technology could be integratable. There's a measure for that in the US, all these developed countries, advanced countries. So you have had that. That means your product is out there and it's doing well and all of that. So the IP covers that aspect of it for investment. Now, <clears throat> the reason why I see these things is I've been saying this to people of African descent. I told them that the, the science and technology has a base. Everything in, in life has the basis. There are people that have certain characteristics which makes them uh, the best runners, the best this or the best that. When it comes to science, it's the same thing. People of African descent have something called the highest affinity to factor, to uh, uh, understanding uh, this modern science and technology because of their affinity to something called fractal. Okay, so I don't know, you've seen the cornrows, you, you've seen different hairstyles. Uh, that are done by African women and all of that. I'm not saying other people don't do it. There's a significance to those things that they do. They are exhibiting the quality of building the massive structure, microscopic structure from the microscopic structure. That's what they're exhibiting. You see the, 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 these uh, hairstyles, that's a science for those who understand. There's a professor called Dr. Iglesias, Ron Iglesias, I've been saying this, but people don't believe me. So I started Googling. I find a, a guy, a white guy, Ron Iglash. He says the same thing I'm saying. You can Google him, Dr. Ron Iglash. He found that that Africa has, and it's the people of African descent that has an innate science through patterns that they can create. And no one else has that. You can Google it and you'll find it. And now, because I'm a spiritual person in the, in the ways of my ancestors, I can see these things, but I keep telling people, like, we have a chance in the technological world to change our lot. We are, we are given this. It's in, it's in our genes, okay? It's, this is in our genes, man. So if you're an engineer and you are an African descent, Stop looking outside for your ingenuity is already inside of you. You got to understand the principles of AFA, IFA. It's a number system that is a computer-based number system, meaning it was the first computer before the computer you see today. 
coming from my background, we had a hexadecimal system before what you see today. We have numbers 0 to 15, and those numbers 0 to 15 has a name attached to them. And when you combine those names, it gives you numbers, and those numbers, when you expand it, it gives you word. And now I can translate that word, uh, explain that word to a lay person. Isn't that what your computer do? We've had that for millions of years. And now I'm using that technology to build AI because the AI you have today is using what is called a large language model. But our languages, including yours, if you're Hindu or you speak Urdu or whatever, you're from India, same thing applies to you. In South India, their language is exactly the same as in Cameroon. The words are the same. You see? So what I'm saying is our languages don't have all the resources the English language has. I came up with a new algorithm. What you could do is this. Your language has a meaning in itself. The language you speak, if you look at the structure, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant, they, they always have a root. The root never change. It could mean something in India and mean another thing in another language, but the root never change. Instead of scouring the whole internet, Western electricity, because we don't have those resources, we can use what we have through our language to develop what we call low resource language model. And with that, all these poor folks all around the globe will now be ushered in into the artificial intelligence space where they can use their creativity to make money and have a better life outcome. So I will continue to say this till all ears we hear it. The worldview of the West is not the same as an African person. African person is well-rounded. African person looks for similarities and differences, while the worldview of the West looks for differences and similarities. Thank you. Hmm. That is so deep, and that is really very powerful. And that is something that we can explore. We need to explore it because, you see, what this is doing to people now is that it's opening up their mind. We need to open up our mind. Some people that I've interviewed tell me something to the effect that we are sleeping, the African people that are sleeping. But of course, because he did a very long analogy, which at the end, he made a kind of a comparison between the African civilization and the Western civilization and say something to the like of uh, that we are the solar civilization, then they have the lunar civilization. Then there was this at alternating time, I think a period of 3,000 years in between, that uh, Africa, the, the, Af the time for Africa has actually reached uh, for us to wake up from our hibern hibernation uh, to reclaim our glory and essentially live our life. And that is like a boat. You cannot have two masters at the same time. One certainly need to be um, rule over the other. Where well, I don't, I'm not an expert in this area, but I can say that there is a lot of information around that we can tap into to help us uh, better navigate the complex world that we are living in. And uh, whatever we do, we must make sure that we understand it within the, our personhood, within the way that we see life and we see ourselves within that life. And I think that is this is really making me very happy. This is a very enriching conversation. All right. Uh, yeah, the time is already about spent here. So I'd, I'd like to pass the mic again to uh, Sister Gloria uh, because I think uh, Dr. Marcel is having a sort of disturbance there in the connection. Uh, the question I'm... Okay, uh, Dr. Marcel is back. In fact, I had a question for you before the network uh, uh, infiltration. Now... What impact did the African diaspora have in shaping the positive change? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm in another meeting. I thought this would be at, finished at nine, but I'm going to go right ahead. I want to look at the impact that the, the heritage has on, on creating change. I want to honor Josiah. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. For the, the, the things you are doing from your end and how you package and harness knowledge 
to push it out because that's one of the reasons, the ways we can impact for positive change, harness the knowledge and share it. Sharing it doesn't mean that we, we send the knowledge along. Sharing means that sometimes we immerse ourselves by giving back to a select group that are really gatekeepers that can continue to share the knowledge in a meaningful way and in an impactful way, meaning for change, while you leave it behind in the sacred hands of these persons who, who you have taught to understand it, who has the similar mindset, who has the similar motive, and who have the right motivation to push the knowledge along. So that's one of the ways that we can. We immerse, we package, and we train. A lot of times, the packaging does not come with a mutual understanding of where we want to go. And, and there are many of us who package our knowledge and send it back. But because of this drawback, it is not... The knowledge is not shared and the power is not shared and authority is not shared and the ownership is not shared. And so persons still feel marginalized. And so the impact cannot be made. So we need to look at that. Then we need to have an holistic approach to heritage preservation and promotion. We must consciously focus on doing that. We must recognize the interconnectedness of, of, of language. For example, as Joasa says, and we must dig into that. We must merge with the modern technologies that help us to promote the culture, the social, economic, and environmental factors, we must tap into those persons so that we can holistically draft an effective approach to address these issues. The issues that arise that are persistent and that smothers the culture and the heritage, whether it is internal or external, we must dig down deep into those issues and we must create a holistic approach or program to have that address. And then we must be very mindful of the difference in mindsets, in motives, and so on. And we must know the difference between appreciation and appropriation also, because persons experience things differently. Exploitation is not just exploitation, it is experienced differently and commodified differently, misrepresented differently. And so we must make sure that the knowledge does not include a blame, but include a resilience and a recovery that make us say, they did not kill us, we are still here and we are here for a reason. And so we must understand our why and we must put the things out there with that original consent that was given to us at birth. We must not fight or run away from collaboration and partnership. We must just choose who we are to partner with. And while we are partnering with them, we must, we must scrutinize their motives and we must scrutinize their platforms and we must select carefully those partnerships that will promote and ensure that the initiatives that are aimed at preserving and promoting our heritage is inclusive enough, is participatory enough, and respectful of the communities, the voices, and the agencies through which these will be sent. Finally, I want to say that we must respect and uphold the dignity of those who, and the sensitivity of the heritage and how the heritage impacts person. Trauma cannot be dealt with on the surface. It cannot be dealt with in a training. It cannot be dealt with in a packaging. It is an individual and direct approach because pain is the same trauma is experienced differently by different persons and the pain lingers for some much longer than others and the pain and trauma of our history historical injustices must be celebrated as we celebrate our resilience and cultural achievements, but it must be done pointedly and very, very intentionally so that we do not hurt our own selves in the process and we do not cause a disconnect and a disengagement. And as we acknowledge that the African diaspora is not a monolithic entity, 
it is very diverse. It's, it has diverse cultures, languages, and experiences that are shaped by, how would I say it now, historical, contextual, geographical, and socioeconomic factors. We must appreciate that how it is being felt by us is not how it is being felt by a different area or a different context or a different situation. The final thing I want to say that is important to me is that we must, we must not try to do these things at a large scale. We, we, we find that when we do that, we are fighting for the scarce benefits and spoils and the message does not get out there. The preservation does not start. The appreciation is not cultivated. We must use the strength that we have. Go with the strength that we have and make these scarce benefits and spoils become common traits and natural traits for those who are coming behind us. Thank you for allowing me to share. Obi, I have to run. I am Dr. Marcia Thomas, Christian leadership consultant and life coach. I help faith-based introverted female leaders to recover from life traumas and pivot with power. I tell the stories of children and so on so that they can become masters of their own destiny. And I also do an audio live on Tuesdays. I have a Pivot with Power program for all of these things. Thank you for listening, for allowing me to share, Gloria. It's good to have you. Josiah, you were so insightful. Obi, continue to do what you're doing. And remember to subscribe to my newsletter, my blog, and my YouTube channel. Have a great day, everyone. I'm just sorry that I cannot stay until the end. Thank you so much for that. No, no, no. That is actually the end. I just need to pass the mic to... Uh, to uh, Sister Gloria uh, to have a final take, then, then the conversation has, uh, that, that, is, that is what we planned for. We said one hour, 30 minutes. And this will really be a very intense conversation. And I really want to thank uh, all of you for the contribution. This is highly, highly enriching. And of course, make sure you connect among yourself. That also is important for us. Okay, Sister Gloria, please go ahead and share your last take. Wow, how, how incredible. Let me first... Um say thank you to everybody, all the speakers. Um, Brother Josiah, wow. Um, I mean, there's so many gems that um, you, you laid out. I was thinking about, uh, you know, they said um, knowledge is power. I was reading somewhere that they said during the slavery time, uh, the, the women um, used their hair to communicate. So all the patterns, all those, you know, type of things. That, that, these, these are rich histories. These are ancestors. These are the things that they did. The struggles, you know, they, 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 they worked out ways to, to, to support each other, to hold each other up, to, to keep each other from falling down. So this is what the, we have the blueprint. You know, what are we doing to, to help each other? What are we doing, you know, to, to support each other? What are we doing from, to, to, to help um, one another from falling down by the wayside. May we not, you know, be part of um, um, the, the 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 hand that that use that that hurts us. You know, the other thing that I um, heard was um, that that statement about Africans looking at similarities in differences, and in the West, differences and similarities. Whoa, talk about um, powerful words. I, I, my mind is just totally blown by all of this. But you know. There's also that expression, if you want to go, if you want to travel quickly, go on your own. If you want to go far, go with others, something to that effect. There's so many different things, so, so much learning today. And, you know, my thanks not only goes to the speakers, but to all of you who have patiently, quietly been listening, sending your energies, because that's, all of it has what has made uh, today's um, uh, room powerful. You know, sometimes it's not, you know, all that performative thing that you see people doing. Sometimes that, that silence, you know, our, our, our grandfather, our forefathers, our ancestors, the, the, the power in silence and sending love and strength and energy. I could feel it from all of you. As I'm looking at your faces, you know, the pictures are still, but I feel your energies. This is what we do, people, brothers and sisters. This is what we do. Okay, I know we're out of time now. I have so now I have so much more to say. But anyway, um, my name is <laughs> my name is Gloria Tinu Um, I can be found on um, uh, LinkedIn. My website GloriaOgumbadejo.com. You can find out about my work. 
Um, may, may our vibrant ancestors show up in our lives. God bless you all. May we be observant and ready to receive the wisdom and divine gifts that are waiting for us. And may we be, may we be delivered from all the harm um, that surrounds us. May our children be protected. God bless you all. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I really do. And this is what we are actually here for, to connect among each other. And when you hear the term connect, we essentially mean that in the classes.org, if you go to our website, you see that we pay a lot of attention to the connection, the collaboration, the co-working, co-creation also of the services that we render. So that, for example, we could create courses with different experts so that we bring these courses before the community, before the people who are looking for ways to explore the conversation that we are sharing here. So if any of this makes sense to you, why don't check out aclasses.org and see what we are doing. And you can be part of that too. You can come to learn if you want to, or you can come to share if you want to. Because in one way or the other, you are valid, you are important. The experiences that you have made up to this point is important. Don't keep it in your head. Come to refine it or come to share what you have learned to help other people to learn. This is the mission that we have. So make sure you take advantage of it and make sure you are here in two weeks time because every two weeks we come up with a different conversation around the diaspora storytelling. <laughs>